Good morning, family. Welcome this morning to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is Lord of all and the Word of God still transformed life. We're excited and delighted that you have tuned in today to be a part of our Sunday morning broadcast. As I always say, it's no accident or coincident that you have tuned in but it's by the providence of God. God has something he want to say, something he wants to do in your life. And so the Lord has directed you to be a part of our Sunday morning broadcast. You know, we have started our faith campaign. One of the reasons we have our faith campaign uh, is because during this time of year, during the month of November and December, a lot of people get depressed. A lot of people get depressed. They withdraw from church. Uh, it start getting darker sooner. You know, in the evening time, about 5.30, 6 o'clock, it's dark. And a lot of people, uh, they uh, are just like turtles. They go up in their shell, and they don't really come out until the first of the year. You don't hardly see them around uh, the month of November. They just go to work, uh, they come home, and they don't be out in the public. They, and they get depressed. They get depressed. They, a lot of people are getting depressed um, because, uh, you know, this is the holiday season. They don't have the funds. Uh, they done lost jobs. Uh, they done lost loved ones and what have you. Uh, but we have this faith campaign to try to strengthen your faith, to try to uh, encourage you to stay in the Christian race. Don't, don't fall out of the race. Keep on pressing on. Keep running all the way to the end, as the old folks say, and see what the end's going to be. Now, today we have a great sermon for you. Matter of fact, it's a teaching sermon. It's a teaching sermon. I, 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 I want to teach uh, more than I want to preach today. And because I want to talk about a very serious matter. My sermon is entitled, How We Get In and Out of Depression. How We Get In and Out of Depression. Oh, I know you want to know how we get in, but more important, I know you want to know how we going to get out of depression. And uh, we're going to tell you about that. But right now, our praise team going to come. They're going to sing. And then right after they finish singing, I'm going to come with a good word from the Lord on how we get in and out of depression. So get ready, get ready, get ready. And let's go to church.
Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for who you are, the God who hear and you still answer prayers. Speak to our hearts now in a mighty way so that the lost can be saved, the saved can be encouraged, backsliders can come back to you. If somebody in need of a church home, Lord, we pray you touch their heart and they'll join right here at Bible Way. So Holy Spirit, have your way. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on and put your hands together. I'm so happy that God didn't pass me by. I don't know about you, but you ought to be happy that why on others are calling, because a lot of people are calling. Thank God they're calling the Lord, on the Lord. But it's good that he heard your lit humble cry. Amen. Have you ever thought about that? We got over 7 billion people on the planet. But God hears your lit. Prayer is the most amazing thing to me. Lord have mercy. For those of you who have your Bible, open with me to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings 19. I want to look at verses 1 through 18, but I just want to read the first four verses, and that'll be enough to get us started. Would that be all right? Look at what the text says. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life at the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belonged to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Think about it. Elijah, the man of God, said, it's enough. He wanted to die. He said, take away my life or I'm not better than my father's. We're looking at a depressed man. Yes. That's why I want to talk about how to get in and out of depression. Amen. How to get in and out of depression. Y'all going to go with me? I have to go by myself. Tell three or four people that pastor going to talk about how to get in and out of depression. <laughs> A 
Amen. Amen. I'm going to need your prayers this morning. Amen. I'm trying to preach him with this mask on and my glass is getting all foggy. I need your prayers this morning. How to get in and out of depression. Depression is a common, but it's a serious mood disorder. Symptoms of depression can include loss of interest in things that you used to enjoy, changes in weight, difficulty sleeping or oversleeping, energy loss, feeling worthless, and thoughts of death and suicide. Over three million children each year suffer from depression. Over 17 million adults each year suffer from depression. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the United States among people between the ages of 15 and 44. Women are twice as likely to be depressed as men. Depressions are uh, cases of depressions are three times higher now uh, since the lockdown of the COVID-19 than they was before COVID-19. So whatever figures I gave you, those was the 2017 figures, just multiply them by three. So rather than it being 17 million people a year, that's depressed. Now, post-COVID, it's 51 million people. Rather than 3 million children that's depressed now, multiply that by 3, it's 9 million children that are depressed. Oh, one of the strange facts that I found is those who counsel depressed people have to guard against depression for they end up getting depressed. I heard a story, I don't know how true it is, but I heard a story about this police saw a man that was depressed getting ready to jump off a bridge. And he saw him and he told him, don't jump, don't jump. And he went on up there and he began to counsel with the man and talk with the man. But after listening to the man depressed story, both of them jumped. <laughs> you have to guard yourself against depression when you are dealing with depressed people. I was surprised to find out that the more intelligent you are and the more religious you are, the more susceptible you are to depression. When you just study all of the people who have ever lived who was battling with depression, it'll surprise you. I, I, I was surprised to find that Martin Luther, the great scholar of the 15th century, the, the great Bible scholar, the great reformer, battled with depression. Uh, the great preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who had the largest church in London back in the late 1800, battled with depression. Martin Luther King Jr battle with depression. The last speech that he gave, that famous mountaintop speech where he says, I've been to the mountaintop. I, I looked over and I've seen the promised land. He almost didn't give that speech because he was in bed all day long battling with depression. The more religious you are, and the more intelligent you are, you are susceptible to depression. A case in point of that is right in our lesson today. 
uh, Elijah, a very intelligent man, a very religious man, battle with depression. Y'all gonna go with me, I'm gonna have to go by myself. Uh, this man battle with depression. Matter of fact, that's what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna teach today. Uh, because we're dealing with a serious subject. But my question is, I said, how in the world did Elijah get in depression and then how did he get out of depression? Because I think if we can figure out how he got in depression and how he got out of depression, I think that can help us understand how we get in depression and how we can get out of depression. Uh, uh, I saw four things. Uh, how he got in depression, I see for how he got out of depression. Uh, he got in depression, first of all, we get in depression when we try to be first. When we try to be first, you end up getting depressed. E Elijah, when you go back up into chapter uh, 18, uh, beginning with verse number 41 through 46, you'll find that Elijah got in a race with King Ahab. He got in a race of, uh, King Ahab had a horse and chariot, and Elijah outran them on feet. He beat a horse and a chariot in the rain. Uh, now, he ran about 20 miles uh, when he done that. And he was tired after that. Uh, let me tell you something. When you try to outdo a king, when you try to outdo the king's horses, you're going to end up being depressed. Oh, I ain't in your neighborhood yet, so let me just bring it on down. Uh, where the rubber meets the road when you try to keep up with the Joneses. You're going to end up being depressed. When, uh, when you read it even a little bit further, you see that Elijah says at the end of verse number four, he says, I'm not better than my father's. See, he, he had this mentality where he wanted to be first in everything. He was trying to be better than Abraham and better than Isaac and better than Jacob. These, these were his forefathers. He was trying to be better than Moses. I'm going to be better than Moses. I'm going to be better than David. And when he found out that he could not be better than them, he ended up getting depressed. How many of you know you can't keep up with the Joneses? I, I, I don't care uh, what kind of car you got, somebody's going to always have a better car than you. I don't care what kind of clothes you got, somebody always going to have better clothes than you. I don't care how big a, a house you got, somebody going to always have a bigger house than you. I don't care what kind of furniture you got, somebody going to have better furniture than you. I don't care how fast you can run, how you can shoot that ball. There's always somebody that can outrun you, jump higher than you, shoot that ball better than you. I don't care who you are. There's always somebody better than you. You won't always be first. Listen, this is why you don't need to be trying to keep up with the Joneses. Just do you. Amen. Can't nobody beat you doing you. Oh, you're going to get depressed when you're trying to compare yourself with others and trying to be like this one over here and be like that and over there. You end up getting depressed. Number two, you end up getting depressed when you are fearful of your future. When you're fearful of your future. Elijah was fearful of his future. Uh, when he found out that Jezebel put out a contract on his life. She told him, just like you done killed uh, my uh, 800 uh, prophets, 
and they dead, you're going to end up being dead just like them. As a result, he took off and started running. See, he didn't see a future anymore. See, you got to be careful whenever there is a death, particularly even a death, and you are close to that person who have died, you got to be careful because you'll start thinking that I'm going to be next. You got to be careful uh, 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 when your focus is on death. You'll start thinking, I'm getting ready to die. Amen. You don't see no future. Sometimes if a person is real close to you and they done died, you'll start wanting to join them. Yeah. You don't see no future on earth anymore. When you don't see a future on earth, are you fearful of your future? You end up getting depressed. Amen. Then when you lose focus, number three, when you lose your focus, you end up getting depressed. When you look right here at this text, I believe it's verse number 10. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down thine altar, and slain thy prophets which are with the sword, and I, even I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Think about what Elijah is saying there. Elijah is saying that, Lord, things are bad here on this earth. Things are bad here in Israel. Lord, he's informing God, God, they are tearing down your altar. They killing the prophets and stuff. Matter of fact, I'm the only one left. Ain't nobody else left but me. Now, what is he doing? He done took his focus and putting his focus on what he doing and what everybody else around him is doing. And he compared what he done done of what he's doing and what they ain't doing. I'm serving you, Lord, but ain't nobody else serving you. Listen, when you start comparing what you're doing, and, and then you start looking at what other folks ain't doing, you end up getting depressed. This is why folks get depressed on their job. They go to work, they working hard, and they, but they start looking around and say, now I'm working, but ain't nobody else out here working. They don't want to go to work no more. They're depressed. This is, this is why people give up on their marriages. They look at what I'm doing, but Rufus ain't doing what he's supposed to do. They get all depressed because Betty Ann ain't doing what she's supposed to do. Listen, you ain't got the answer to the Lord for Betty Ann. You got the answer to the Lord for you. You done lost all focus on what Betty Ann ain't doing. You just keep doing what you supposed to do because she got the answer to the Lord for herself. Don't be going around looking at what you doing, going around looking at what other folks are doing. Listen, when your conversation is all about people, you done lost focus. When your conversation is all about you, you done lost focus. Don't be looking at so much what you doing and what other folks is doing. You need to be looking at what he doing. If God is not the source of your conversation and the center of your conversation, you done lost all focus, baby. You're going to end up depressed. And then when you, number four, when you are withdrawn from society, you end up being depressed. Look, look right here at verse number nine. It says, and he came hither unto a cave. Elijah done crawled up in a cave. Somebody asked a question. Is there a such thing as a cave man? Yeah. <laughs> Elijah done went back in time. People don't live in caves no more. Not even in the Elijah day. But look what he's trying to do. He's trying to be a cave man. He done took himself out of civilization. He done went two, three hundred miles away from civilization and then got in a cave. Listen, when you withdraw from people, 
See, God made you to be around people. You didn't come on this earth and there was no people. <laughs> you can't live without people. <laughs> you need some people. You sure need people today. Hello, somebody. Because many of us here don't even know how to grow our own food. So you sure need some people. But you end up getting depressed when you withdraw Amen. from others, when you can't be first, when you're fearful of your future, when you're lost focus, you end up getting depressed. That's how he got depressed. Now, how do we get out of depression? We saw how he got in. Now, how do you get out? Y'all gonna go with me, I'm gonna have to go by myself. Number one, take care of yourself physically. Take care of yourself. Take care of yourself physically. Look here at verse number five through verse number eight. The Bible says that an angel came there and cooked them a cake and told him to get up, Elijah, and eat this cake and then drink this water. There was a bottle of water there. Tell them, drink the water, eat the cake. And then the angel said, no, no, eat some more. Yeah. Eat some more of the cake and drink some more water. Because the angel knew that he was getting ready to go on a 40 day fast. He was getting ready to go all the way, the Bible says there to Mount Horeb. Do you know where Mount Horeb is at? That's the mount to God. That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Now you think about it. Elijah, he was in Israel. He done ran to Bathsheba. That's 90 miles away. And then he done crossed the border because Bathsheba basically was right there at the border. But now he done went another 100, maybe 200 miles all the way there to where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Amen. And so the angel says, you better eat a whole lot because the journey is going to be great. Yeah. See, heaven already know what you're planning on doing. Yeah. Hello, somebody. The Bible says the steps of a good man is even ordered by the Lord. Yeah. See, God knew what Elijah was going to do, but he needed some food. He needed some nourishment. Listen, the first step back to recovery from depression is take care of yourself physically. Amen. Get you something to eat, get you something to drink, get you some sleep, take care of yourself physically. As a matter of fact, I can recall uh, after we had started Bible Way here, I can remember one summer, I started having these headaches. And so I went, to the doctor to get it checked out. See, if you got a headache, don't be going around saying that the devil trying to put something on you. No, see, we give the devil way too much credit. That ain't nothing but the devil. No, go, go there to the, the doctor and see. A, a Tylenol may work. You hear him trying to rebuke the, I rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. Go, go see the doctor. Go see the doctor. I went to see the doctor, and the doctor examined me out here, examined me. He says, uh, tell me a little bit about your step. He says, uh, do you eat right? I said, well, uh, sometimes I eat breakfast, but most of the time I eat dinner. I eat dinner. I go home every night and eat dinner. And he says, what about you drinking water? I said, I don't drink no water. He said, what about you sleeping? I said, I don't sleep too many hours a night. He said, what about exercise? I said, I don't do no exercise. <laughs> he said, really, ain't too much wrong with you. He says, let me tell you what you need to do. 
He says, you need to eat right. He says, drink you plenty of water. He said, in your case, you're so dehydrated. He said, don't you pass a water fountain. He said, when you see a water fountain. <laughs> Amen. As, as a matter of fact, that's why if you ever come in my office, you always see a bottle of water, whether it's open or, or closed. It's just a reminder for me to drink water. And so he's, and then he says, you just need to exercise. He says, you just need to get out and walk. Walk three or four days a week. And he says, if you just eat right, sleep right, drink you plenty of water, and walk th three or four days a week, he said, them headaches going to go away. You're going to relieve all that stress. In other words, what the, I went and paid a doctor to tell me to take care of yourself physically. So I'm trying to save you some money this morning. You don't need to have to go to no doctor. Just take care of yourself physically. Then number two, take care of yourself spiritually. Take care of yourself spiritually. Uh, when you read this text, God asked Elijah in verse 9 at the end, he said, what does thou hear, Elijah? And then Elijah went through this field in verse 10 about how I'm the only one, you know, that's serving you. And God, verse 11, he says, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord said, I'm going to pass by. And the Bible says, that there was a wind that came by and the wind just about tore the mountain down. But the scripture says God wasn't in the wind. Then the scripture says that there was an earthquake that came by and just shook the mountain. You know, it takes something to shake a mountain. But the Bible says God wasn't in the earthquake. And then it said it was a fire that came by. But the Bible says God wasn't in the fire. But then the Bible says it was a still small voice that came by. And Elijah came and he stood out on the mount, just like Moses had stood out on that mount. And he wrapped his mallet over him as a sign of respect. In other words, he knew that that was the voice of God. Now you think about it. What was God trying to tell Elijah? Elijah, don't always look for the spectacular. See, people today, they're into miracles. They're into something big and bold happening. And, and they're running over here to, because they see miracles over there. They see miracles over there. Let me tell you, God is not in a lot of these big stuff. Let me tell you, God is not in a lot of this earthquake and stuff. God is not in a lot of this stuff that the world is saying, Oh, child, you should have been there. No, you shouldn't because God wasn't in that. No, God is in some little stuff. If you want to see God today, God is moving by his spirit in a little stuff. The Bible says it's not by power, not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. It's in a little stuff. And then God asked him at the end of the verse, he said, what you doing here, Elijah? Yeah. Yeah. Why did you go two, three hundred miles away from where I have called you to be to just get a word from the, the Lord? Yeah. Let me let you know, you don't have to go yeah. hundreds of miles no, to get a word from the Lord. Yeah. You don't have to go and cross the border over to Canada to get a word from the Lord. You don't have to go to Mexico to get a word from the Lord. You don't heard of these people saying, you know, I got to go on a pilgrimage. I got to go for where Jesus walked. And I got to go and, and for where Jesus used to be at over there. And if, you don't have to go to Israel to get a word from the Lord. 
you can get a word from the Lord right on your job. You can get a word from the Lord in your local church. You can get a word from the Lord right there in your house. Right in your bedroom. Uh, you can get a word from the Lord right in your living room. Yeah. You can get a word from the Lord right in your prayer closet. Yeah. Jesus says, uh, when you pray, go into your prayer closet. Yeah. And he says, talk to the Father in secret and the Father will reward you openly. Yeah. You don't have to go across the world to get a word from the Lord. Take care of yourself spiritually. That's why every day you need to get up, read your Bible. Get a word from the Lord. God speaking in his word. You don't have to follow this miracle worker and go four or five hundred miles to, to get a word. No, no. Just open your Bible. Read your Bible. Get your Facebook right here. Get your face in this book. And get a word from the law. Take care of yourself. Listen, listen, listen. If you read your Bible every day, uh -huh. say your prayers every day, whatever you hear going on in the world, catch it and put it up in prayer. Hem it up in prayer. A life that's hemmed up in prayer is not easily unraveled. And go to church. If you do those three things, read your Bible, pray, and go to church. You'll make it. I say, you'll make it. Take care of yourself. Spiritually. And then take care of yourself socially. Take care of yourself socially. Notice what God tells Elijah here in verse 15. He says, and the Lord said to him, go return on thy way to the wilderness and the master. And when thou cometh, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shadpak, uh, a Benmala, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him that escaped from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Notice God is saying, Elijah, I'm calling you out of retirement. Come out your cave. Come out your man cave. <laughs> Come out your cave. I got work for you to do. And notice, he says now, don't go back the way that you came. I don't want you to go back the way you came. See, which way did he come? He went due south. He went to Bathsheba to the border and he kept on going across the border. Went on over into Egypt. God says, I don't want you to go back the same way that you came. Why is that? Because see, Jezebel is coming after you. She's coming that way. So God says, I want you to go this way. I want you to go this way. That way you won't bump into Jezebel. I want you to go this way. And he says, I want you to go through the wilderness. How many of you know God's plan is often through the wilderness? <laughs> he took them through the wilderness and he says I want you to get your oil out I want you to anoint Hazel okay. to be king there in Syria how many of you know God is not limited to just Israel right. 
God is Lord of all. He raised up kings and he take them down. And then God says, I want you to anoint Jehu. And then I want you to anoint Elijah. And whoever escaped the sword of Hazel, Jehu gonna get him. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Hazel and them got Ahab, but they left Jezebel. But that was all right, cause Jehu got Jezebel. Yeah. And then he says, and if anybody escaped Jehu, Elijah, it's going to get, what, what does that happen? See, God has got a plan. Amen. See, sometimes we look at world problem and we say, oh man, we get so depressed. Uh-uh, you don't need to get depressed because God got a plan. Yes. He ain't never without a plan. Did you hear what I said? He's never without a plan. And as long as you got breath, you are part of his plan. So come on out of your man cave. Come on out of your woman cave. Because God has got work for you to do. Oh, yes. A lot of times people say, well, I don't know what the Lord want me to do. You start where you're at. Yeah, you start right there where you're at. You know, there's a lady. I know a lady. And this, and, and this lady, uh, she got four kids from 17 year old all the way down to six year old and she got a husband. But she left her husband this year. And all year long she been going to different cities running after uh, uh, this kind of uh, seminar and that kind of seminar trying to find the will of God for her life. You don't have to run 500 miles to find the will of God for your life. You start right where you at. What's your responsibility? That's the will of God for your life. <laughs> if you're a mama, then you be the best mama to them children that you can be. If you're a daddy, you be the best daddy that you can be. If you're a husband, you be the best husband that you can be. If you're a wife, you be the best wife that you can be. If your son be the best son that you can be. If your daughter be the best daughter that you can be. You start where you're at. And then God will take you further. But it starts at home. God is not going to call you to do something to the church and you're messing up there at the house. You got responsibility at home. Take care of home first. And then once you take care of home, God will elevate you because you don't humble yourself. And the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you in due time. And you'll see yourself doing stuff at the church and then you'll see yourself doing stuff in the community. See, Elijah started doing stuff that he ain't never thought that he was going to do. See, a lot of times people give up because they done got bored with life and life done got to be a routine. But if you stay with God, God will take you places that you ain't never been before. You'll see yourself doing stuff that you ain't never done before. Elijah ain't. We ain't never read about him anointing people with oil, but now he's God all man. Come in, Hazel. Let me put this all on you. Come in, uh, Jehu. Put that all on him. Come here, Elijah. Put that all on him. God will do new things in your life if you stay with the Lord. And then he raised up Elijah, a young man, for him to train for the next generation. A lot of times people say, they get old senior citizen. They say, I don't know what the Lord got me to do. Listen, all that wisdom you got in you, all that knowledge you got in you, all that gray hair that you got, you know some stuff. You know some stuff. You can help somebody with all of that knowledge that you got. 
if your grandmama work with them grandkids. You say, I ain't got no grandkids. Work with them kids that you know. There are some kids in your life. You say, but I ain't got no kids. But you're an auntie. Work with them, uh, your nieces and your nephews. You're an uncle. Work with these nieces and your nephews. Oh, and you start doing that. The sky's the limit. Oh, God has got some great things in store. And listen, I preached this before. Everybody needs a Paul, somebody older than you. Then you need a Barnabas, somebody around your same age. And then you need a Timothy, somebody younger than you. And God raised up a little Timothy for this man, him, that he can pour out for the next generation. That's why you got these gray hair. Yeah. That's the next generation. The Bible says gray hair is honor. The Bible says that the strength of a young man, that's his honor. But that's going to come a time you're going to lose that honor, young man. And that's where the gray hair is going to come in. So now, I got the honor, but it's the gray hair. Get with people. Come out of the cave and get with people. Take care of yourself socially, then family. Take care of yourself emotionally. Take care of yourself emotionally. Verse 18, God tells Elijah, Elijah, I got 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, not even kissed them. What was Elijah complaint? I'm the only one. Everybody else done been killed and they trying to kill me. I'm the only one. God seemed to throw in an FYI for your information. Yeah. <laughs> you ain't the only one, Elijah. <laughs> what was Elijah's problem? He was walking by sight rather than by faith. See, as long as you walk by sight, you're going to get all depressed. See, that's why I don't go around listening to CNN. You, you listen to CNN and cable news and stuff, and they paint a picture of how bad the world is. Man, you'll be like Elijah. You'll be in lockdown. Do you know a lot of people are still in lockdown today? We started uh, a COVID-19 back in uh, March of uh, uh, 2020. But a lot of people are still in COVID shutdown. Why is that? Because they're scared of the future. And see, if you just keep listening to how many people are dying, how many people are dying, you're going to start thinking, I'm getting ready to die. I'm trying to protect myself because I, I ain't ready to die just yet. You don't need to be even thinking about death. You need to be thinking about life. The Bible says, choose life. But as long as you're listening to cable news, yes. you're going to get depressed. Absolutely. And you're going to start hating on people that you don't even know. Yes. You don't know them people in Washington. No. Quit hating on them. The Bible tells you to pray for them people. They need your prayers. When you're saying the president can't hardly walk up the steps to get in the plane there, pray for him. He loses his train of thought a lot. Pray for him. He need our prayers. But I don't care what CNN show you. They don't know it all. Don't get depressed. Because they don't know it all. Yeah. They just know just a little bit of the news. But I know somebody, y'all. I say, I know somebody. that know all the news because God Almighty he's omniscient that means he know everything 
not just some things he know everything and he's omnipresent that means he's everywhere and he's omnipotent that means he got all power in his hand and so I don't care what they showing you just know it ain't as bad as they say it is no it ain't nobody as bad as they say it is cause see they just walking by sight but you walking by faith and when you walk by faith it ain't never as bad as you think it is see why is that because God is never without a witness did you hear what I said? See, God is never without a plan, but he's never without a witness. I don't care how bad it is over here. God is never without a witness. I remember, I remember when I first came out here. 20-year-old boy. I needed a job, so I went over here to this plant, Frito Light. But I was nervous about going and working in a plant because I had heard a lot of things, not so much about Frito Lay, but just working in a plant. I heard that plant people can be messy people. <laughs> plant people was angry people because they overwork and underpaid. Uh, plant people, it, it can be like paying plants out there. The world turns, search for tomorrow out there on the job and so I was kind of leery about I didn't want to go out there and mess up my home place like that but one of my first night working there there was a lady that came up to me with this long dress on way down there she came up to me and she said what's your name I told her my name Timothy Wilbur she said where are you from? Because you're not from Ryan here, are you? I said, no ma'am, I'm not from Ryan here. I told her I'm from Brookhaven, Mississippi. She said, I thought so. She said, this is your first time from home, ain't it? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, listen, you look like you're scared. <laughs> she said, you're a Christian? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you're a scared Christian, though. <laughs> she said, what I'm going to do. I'm gonna pray for you. She said, when I look at you, I can tell God has got great things in store for you. And she said, you just stay with the Lord, young man. And she took my hand and she'd start praying for me right there in front of everybody. <laughs> she prayed for me and she says, I'm gonna be praying for you. Who would have ever thought that God had a witness there? When I was in seminary, I needed a job and I went and I joined this church in South Dallas and my pastor appointed me as an outreach minister and he wanted me to work in the projects. I started to tell him no, but I said, I need this job. <laughs> and so I went on down there to the projects Bass Creek, Turner Court, back in the 1980s. This was one of the worst projects in Dallas. This was during the time when drugs, cocaine, and crack was at its highs. The office down there was supposed to give me a lit space, a lit office, something, but they kept moving me around down there. And so one day there was an old lady in her 80s. She saw what they was doing. She said, they don't want you to be down there, do they? They don't want you to have your Bible studies, do they? She says, listen, come on over to my house and you can have your Bible studies at my house. Amen. Who would have ever thought Amen. that God had a witness down there? Amen. I went to Ecuador a few years ago and there in Ecuador, we flew into Quito. Quito is a big major city, just like New York City, big modern time. But then we got in the van the next day and we went eight hours. That's like driving from here to Mississippi and we went up 
the mountain, down the mountains, around the mountain with all of these woods. And then we came to this little bitty town, this little bitty village. And there at this little town, right in the middle of the town, they had this statue. And it was a horse with wings. And I began to say, wait a minute. Is this one of these mythological Greek gods? I said, this could be an idol right in the middle of the town. Yeah. And that disturbed my spirit. But then they said, it's time for lunch. I said, good. <laughs> and so we went to this lady's house opposite of this statue. And when I got in there, we sat down at the dining table. We started eating, and after I finished eating, I looked over on the other side of the table, and I saw this box, and it was a Christmas tree. I said, a Christmas tree? I want this, this lady a Christmas. Then when I went in the kitchen to take my plate to tell her thank you, I looked up on the wall and I saw a picture of Jesus. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? God had a witness. Yeah. Right there. And then I heard a story about a preacher who went to Russia. And there in Russia, you know, they don't want you to preach and teach about Jesus. It's a communistic country. But they don't even believe that there is a God. It's an atheistic country. They teach their people there is no God. There was this preacher, though. He was getting ready to cross the street, waiting on the light to turn. And there was a Russian that came and stood there right by him. And the Russian asked the preacher, uh, are you an American? He said, yes, I am. He says, so what are you doing here in Russia? He says, I'm a gospel preacher. The Russian reached in his pocket and pulled out a black book, a holy Bible. And he says, you see this Bible? I'm one of the only few people in this town that's got a Bible. And then he put it in his pocket right quick and both of them walked on across the street. What I'm trying to get you to see, I don't care where you go, God is never without a witness. You can work on the most messy job, but God is never without a witness. You can go to the worst side of town, but God is never without a witness. You can go to the furthest part of the jungle, but God is never without a witness. You can go to the most atheistic country in the world where they're teaching the people there is no God, but God is never without a witness. So whatever you're going through, stay encouraged. Because it's never as bad as you think it is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Take this word and use it now. To bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.